how do you get a hole in the bottom of your boat that looks like this? Lightning strike, that's how. G'day people, this is a uh, update on the overall situation of, well, everything I guess, uh, including my health. Let's not dwell on this too long because we're, I think we're all thoroughly sick of COVID, well, COVID part two or 28. It's more than four weeks and I still can't handle animal protein, gives me headaches and puts me to bed for like eight hours. So anyway, it's all crazy. But the good thing about it, I think it was a blessing in disguise because it sort of uh, stopped my death wish and madness about sailing solo um, to the Eastern Caribbean, beating the boat, smashing it into wind for 14 days is certainly not going to be good for a boat with suspect uh, hull integrity. So uh, karma heads have prevailed. That's what happens when you can't move a muscle and you're sitting in bed for like two weeks. So um, that's not going to happen. Now, what I'm also going to show you today is the leaking or the weeping uh, is getting worse. So. Well, look, I could just go into it, but let me just show you. Now, when I first discovered this, is was a bit of a shock. Uh, normally, this area under the helm looks like this. So, basically, any weeping or leaking here just quietly just went into the bilge, under the motor, into the bilge, and automatically got ejected by the bilge pump. This is the area that I found wet with salt water. It appeared to be leaking from three holes. So I removed some of the paint and I dug the holes out a bit and then keyed in some epoxy filler to seal off the leak. Yes, epoxy can stick to wet surfaces as I showed you when I did the underwater repair after the lightning strike. As you can see, the area is dry now. So this dodgy repair is doing the job, but I'm curious to see how it is underneath now. I have another epoxy job to do today, so I'll just recover this later. This spot here is one of the holes that I buried the epoxy filler in, so we need to dig it a bit to get rid of the plug to see what's there. Yeah, it's definitely salty. And not to mention it smelt like rotten eggs. Typical stale seawater smell. It was really just leaking at that spot, but I'm looking over there and that's all wet. See, if you can see that, that's all moist. And the wood here shows indication of constant wetting. It looks like the weeping starts about here. Cleaning this up a little and having a little dig, more salt water. And here at the very back of the boat, there is a pool of water where there never ever was a pool. It seems to be leaking from here. And there are more weeping spots and little pools. So what does all of this mean? Well, look, the weeping in itself is not going to sink the boat. I mean, it's it's very small but what it where it's leaking from it's leaking from the core so remember this boat is out of skin of fiberglass aluminium frame with uh, foam filling the voids and then an inner skier the inner skin and so what's happening is it's the inner skin that's breached that i can see the weeping so it's coming from somewhere now because it's continually flowing in there must be water coming in through the outer hull uh, outer skin so we need to find those holes. So Freedom's adventuring days in the near future are, well, curtailed, and um, she needs to go up on the hard, and a really, really thorough, thorough hull investigation needs to take place. We need to find the holes, all the cracks. If there's one or more, I don't know. We also need to, um, because the, whole, the, the core is saturated, we need to somehow uh, drain the core, and dry it as much as possible and then have it all sealed up. We also got to look at the question of delamination because I fail to see how 30 to 50,000 amps or whatever it is comes, makes its way into the hull and I'll explain to you why I know it got into the hull. Comes into the hull, superheats the aluminium frame and any resi uh, residual moisture in there and doesn't cause rapid expansion and doesn't delaminate the boat. I, uh, boat. I, I, I fail to see how that can't happen. So that's, I think, the worst thing because delamination actually really affects how strong the hull is. A hull is as strong as the, the laminates or the, the skin to the, 
the foam to the other skin, how that's all stuck together. As soon as it's delaminated and they can move individually, well then, it, then your structural integrity is you know, severely compromised. So all of these, need, all of these things need to be investigated. When I got the boat up on the hard stand straight after the lightning strike and I was doing the repairs, uh, a lot of people wanted to see these repairs and they wrote in and said, hey, where are the repairs? Now, of course, we were quite uh, behind in our videos at that time. And if you remember, I had the two hard drive failures within a few days of each other and I lost all the files. Well, I, I got a tech guy to retrieve them. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, at bytes per second. That's what he was retrieving. But anyway, he got a fraction of the video. So I've put together something. It's a bit fragmented, but I've done my best. Also, well, I should have been, I should, this should have been done like a year ago, but I don't know if you remember that uh, I was going through a rather difficult time with uh, splitting up with Margarita. So, and there's also a lot of complaints with people saying, when are we going to see up to date stuff? And so all of this fell by the wayside. But anyway, uh, for those people who are not interested, well, you've got the update, so you can go rack off. No, sorry, I don't mean to be like this. Sorry, I'm not feeling the best today, people. Uh, anyway, let's not go into this COVID rubbish, but um, here it is. Now, the big hole in the bottom turned out to be two holes in the bottom to repair. Well, the big one, and there was another one. Um, that blew out the um, cockpit drain hole. Well, of course, we all know now that there's some defect in the hull, some breach in the hull as well. But at the time, all I could see was there were two holes to repair. I think there were several paths the current from the lightning took to get to ground. Here is an overly dramatic representation. I know that the lightning didn't travel down the back stay or the staysail stay. The back stay is Dyneema and an insulator, but the staysail stay is stainless, but it terminates in a wooden bulkhead, nowhere near any metal at all, and there was no evidence of any lightning here in any case. I'm pretty sure the lightning didn't travel in the mast material itself, and then get into the compression post, which is right here, and then jump into the hull or, you know, the metal of the hull, uh, or the, the frame. Uh, the reason being is it's about a foot or a bit less than a foot gap between the bottom of the compression post and any part of the hull. But there were 22 wires coming down from the top of the mast. These went into the boat electrical system and this is why the alternator got fried. But there were no burnt wires, so I think only a relatively small part of the current came this way. The shrouds are Dyneema, so the bulk of the current came down the stainless steel forestay, through the stainless steel section at the bow, then into the aluminium there, and then of course throughout the boat. The metallic stern tube was of course in contact with the water, and no doubt close to or in contact with the frame, hence we had the main hole blow out there. But the clearest evidence of the bulk of the current coming through the frame is here. The cockpit drain hole on the starboard side had a hole in it. You can see it here. I'll show you this picture where I started digging around. Now, this, uh, you can see the aluminium right there. Um, this has been attacked by an Allen key, sandpaper, and numerous screwdrivers. So it doesn't quite look like when I first, uh, you know, saw it. But there definitely is a big chunk missing from the frame, and I think it disintegrated itself as it grounded to the water and blew out the weak spot in the fiberglass. The most appropriate thing to say here is bugger. I ground it back to expose some fiberglass. Now because the area is not flat, the best type of glass to use is double bias, which best conforms to curves. Working upside down can be a pain. If you aren't careful, the job will fall off, especially since I'm using epoxy here, which takes longer time to set. Here I'm making a template for the shape of glass to cut. Just so it happens that the shape is a love heart. Old fashioned romantic to the core. Cut out the glass and with the next heart cut it out about 10 to 20 millimeters smaller all around and the next one smaller again. With resining preparation is the key. You're going to have to make sure you've got everything cut out, all the resin um, ready 
part A, part B, if you can already have it already mixed in cups or in two separate cups, just ready to pour in so you don't have to do your, um, now I'm, I'm using epoxy too so it's more precise, you've got to have five to one or two to one or whatever it is, it's not like polyester where you can just go thereabouts, you need one percent or one and a half percent of the, um, the ketone. But I like the epoxy because it's got a superior bond. But anyway, so you have everything ready. I mean, it's better if you've got a, um, a partner in crime. Well, I don't, so I just have to, you know, well, make do. Uh, if you've got someone with clean hands, that's good because then they can, you know, handle emergencies. But you shouldn't have an emergency. Everything should be prepared. So, um, the first thing I did is I got a small paintbrush. I made up a small amount of just uh, straight epoxy and I painted it in. Uh, let's just go to the um, cockpit drain void. I got the brush and I shoved it in as far as I could and because it's just epoxy, you can get it to stick to everything provided it was dry and I had dried it out for like weeks. And so I painted it all inside as far as I could go and even on the lip. And um, I also did that to the big hole underneath, so just painted it all. And then I waited for it to go tacky. Now, um, it was sort of, um, it was advantageous that the cockpit drain was actually in the sun and on the warm side of the boat, and the underside was cold, so the epoxy set a bit quicker, well, actually quite a bit quicker on the cockpit drain so I could actually stagger my work and they weren't getting ready at the same time so as soon as the cockpit drain I was feeling around it was getting tacky then I made up um, some micro balls and epoxy so an epoxy filler so as soon as it was tacky then I just sh shoved as much of that epoxy filler into the void as possible and then made it flush with the, um, the cockpit drain tube so that was all sorted Uh, you want it like the consistency of toothpaste so you can jam it in and it doesn't actually flow uh, too well. Now you mix it up obviously like that but notice how here I'm actually spreading it out and making it quite thin. The reason being is if you've got it quite in a large volume it retains its heat. You want the heat to dissipate because once it gets hot it gets really hot in the middle and it'll set much quicker in the, uh, the middle of it rather than the sides. So you'll find that when you go to then massage it into a hole, there'll be a big solid rock and sometimes it can be quite big and it wrecks the, uh, the job. So get it all mixed thoroughly, spread it out and then use it. Once it started getting tacky, um, I made up another bunch of uh, epoxy filler and then I shammed in the holes and made it all level and made it all nice. Then I went back to the cockpit drain, got two layers of glass and put it across the uh, filler. Obviously with a small paintbrush, painted it on and then I had a small piece of peel ply and you put it on top of the glass and you can massage the resin around to make sure you've got good, good coverage and you make sure all the edges are nice and flush with the, you know, the old resin. So peel ply is a winner people. You should learn to use it it's a wonderful thing so that was all sorted then back to the big hole underneath uh, and actually putting the glass on so I've got the peel ply down there and the first heart I paint next heart I put on and I paint the next heart I put on I paint now you don't want to have it super saturated you don't want it really really wet because when you actually stick it back up I mean you've got actually underneath the peel ply you've got some cardboard so it's got some structure to it, but still, it's going to want to all drop because it's, you know, it's called gravity, you know, see Newton. Put it up and then as quick as you can get masking tape. Now, in this case, it's good to get, um, what I did is, because it was had a slight, um, it wasn't all level, the, the cardboard was not that good in the end because it wasn't um, conforming to that little part where the stern tube was going down. So it was good to shove it up in the first place but then I pulled it away and then I massaged it all in and then I just got stuck into masking tape and I just masking tape all around and underneath the belly of the boat to hold it up. And occasionally one of the corners would dip down a bit but until you get the masking, but when you get the masking tape on it, then it's all sorted. Unfortunately, I don't have the next video that shows me peeling 
the peel ply off, I've only got the final product. So once the previous job was set, I removed the peel ply and then fared it. There was no reason for the cutlass bearing to be affected by the lightning bolt at all. But, you know, to be thorough and to do, go through everything. So basically I moved the, the, um, the shaft side to side and there was no movement at all. Then I moved the shaft up and down and it was probably close to a millimetre, which is well within what people recommend. I, look, this is the first time that I've ever had a cutlass bearing, so I was... Um, you know, falling upon other people's experience. And there was an old guy at the, um, the boat yard at the time, Oliver, and he's had like 19 boats. And uh, he went through it with me and he said, yeah, no, it's all good. In the end, I actually replaced it because if your boat's out, you might as well replace it because it's just going to be easier in the long run. It was likely a huge current that ran within the prop shaft and propeller and then eventually earth with the water. I was wondering whether this could shock the shaft or propeller and deform it. So here I am trying to feel a wobble, but no luck. Time to remove the prop and shaft. I marked up the propeller and looked at the displacements at various points. It was spot on, so now for the shaft. The propeller shaft couldn't be slid backwards, so that would have to wait. More modern boats have the shaft offset to the skeg, so it can be removed easily. My good friend Jeremy, one of my supporters, hi Jeremy if you're watching, top stuff, uh, he suggested that I can use a stethoscope to put on the engine or different parts of the engine and the gearbox to hear for problems. Now, well I was fresh out of stethoscopes, uh, but he didn't actually mean that, but um, I mean it would have been a bit of a stretch uh, if you know, in my medical kit, I've only got tea tree oil if I suddenly had a stethoscope. But what he was actually meaning is uh, you can use a screwdriver and you put the screwdriver on to a part of the engine you put near your ear and you can hear the defects. But I couldn't hear anything. It didn't do much good. Um, not because it wasn't working, it's because, well I think because I'd already disconnected the shaft and the propeller wasn't on it and the gearbox certainly wasn't under load, maybe I wouldn't be able to hear it, hear the clunking if it wasn't under load. So, couldn't hear anything, so well, I had to just remove the gearbox. Okay, there we go babies. I scrutinised meticulously every gear and every bearing, and everything ran smooth as. So it wasn't the gearbox, so I put it back. Come on baby. Oh yes. In my mind there was only one thing left that could make the clunking noise, a bent shaft. Now to check the prop shaft, the engine has to be raised. The stairs have to come out, the dodger collapse, and the block and tackle used on the boom. But the shaft was absolutely fine, so I put it back. Now get this people, uh, when I was putting it all back together, I noticed that the uh, prop shaft coupling with that spacer match, matching up to the gearbox coupling, they weren't parallel. I, I got the, uh, the uh, feeler gauges out and yeah, they weren't parallel. And so I had to adjust the engine mounts to actually get it you know, roughly right. It wasn't uh, perfectly right. This is a huge mission in itself to adjust the engine mounts to actually get this to um, line up. Um, there's a whole procedure. I didn't quite do it like that, um, but I got it roughly right. And um, when I put it in the water and I um, mowed it along, there was no knocking. Now, I did mention before that I changed the cutlass bearing, so it was tight as well, I can think of some obscene uh, similes there, but uh, I'm not going to say them, people. Um, so, I'm not quite sure what I've done. Um, I mean, I did adjust the engine mounts, but um, would it have been enough just with that um, uh, new cutlass bearing? Sorry, I'm just so tired. <laughs> I've got to get this video out. I've got to get it rendered tonight and get it uploaded. So. 
Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. And that's what got me thinking, I mean, about uh, the delamination. I mean, is there something, or is the hull twisted from the lightning, or is there some delamination that's caused the motor to, um, you know, change orientation slightly? I don't know. I don't know these things. If you have any ideas, uh, just send them my way, some personal message, or in the comments section, uh, please do so. So, uh, hopefully you'll see this video tomorrow night. Um, now, what's in store? Well, Freedom has to go back to Panama, it's going to go on, up on the hard and just going to be a thorough whole investigation. We try and work out how to make uh, her ship shape and safe for her next journey.